Okay, let's continue again. Uh, one remark that I just remembered, but uh, still sent me mail about this, is that uh, you do not have to learn uh, free PC. Uh, I was just uh, made clear that I haven't ruled that out in the detailed uh, uh, detail of list of, of detailed sections that no, the detailed list of sections that you need to study. So uh, three phase commit is out. You don't have to uh, to uh, learn that. Okay, I want to continue with. Uh, uh, distributed object-based systems, uh, relax, this is simple. Uh, I, at least I think it is, it's, it's, it shouldn't be too difficult. Um, I, what I think is more di uh, difficult about this part is the terminology. It took me uh, a long while to understand, for example, what an object server was doing. And uh, I still think it's an unnecessarily nasty beast. How many of you have ever been involved in building huge object-oriented programs. Okay, see a few hands. Um, so we got into this, uh, this Java-based stuff years ago. So for example, I was talking about the uh, um, location server uh, that, we, uh, that we developed. Well, at least we is uh, within my group, but there was also a scientific programmer. We programmed everything in Java. And at a certain point, I was going through this code because he was the programmer, I was the reader, and I was trying to understand what was going on. And it, it was just a hell of a job to see where the algorithm was actually taking place. That's Java. You know, it's interface after interface after interface and after interface, and you just wonder by yourself, when is it finally going to do something? Um, I think that's a bit inherent to many of these Java programs. I find it a bit frustrating. I'm a kind of a C programmer, and you know, C doesn't have that many interfaces. It just has <laughs> instruction sets. Lots of things can go wrong with C, by the way. And I must confess, I'm not a proficient programmer anymore. Anyway, so it's, it's more the terminology that makes these things more intricate. Um, of course, having object-oriented stuff or object-based stuff even makes you extremely flexible. And we'll see a small example of that in just a minute. So um, let me talk a bit about remote distributed objects. And let me start by stating, and I make this quite explicit in the book, um, my claim is there is no such thing as a distributed object. Uh, because every time somebody talks about a distributed object, it's an object over there on a machine. Uh, that object is not distributed. It has proxies all over the place, but in essence, it's just implementing a client-server model. The object itself is not distributed which is a very important observation, and for reasons that will become clear, more clear later on. Okay, so the whole idea is, of course, that data and operations are encapsulated in an object. Oh, I am making the assumption that most of you are familiar with object-oriented or object-based programming. Is that a correct assumption? Who is not programmed in an object-oriented language? Just, I just want to test me, I just want to test if my assumption is correct. Okay, a few. Uh, that also means that if, if, if I'm telling stuff that sounds really weird, uh, you let me know. Okay, that's, that's important. Um, so this is kind of the model then. I'll go over this a bit slowly. Operations are implemented as so-called methods, and they are grouped into interfaces. In C, it's just your, 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 your prototype, okay? You, you, your header file, so to say. Object offers only its interface to its clients. That's the only thing, that's the only thing you get to see. The object server is responsible for a collection of objects. Here it already starts to turning into the abstract. You have a client stub, also called a proxy, that implements that interface. And you have a server skeleton that handles the marshalling and unmarshalling of object invocations. Welcome to the world of object orientation. Now, if you take a look at this picture, it's exactly the same picture as in a remote procedure call, right? Almost, because you have your server over here with this really nifty add implementation. That was my, uh, my example. But all the, the hard stuff is being done at the server side. And you have a client over here. And the only thing that this client is offered is an interface. But it's exactly the same interface as the one that is implemented over here. And then you have client-side and server-side stubs, 
And what's happening in these tubs is just a translation of calls into messages that are sent through the operating system over the network to the server side, where then the object is invoked, or in, in non-object terminology, that function is called, and the results are then marshaled back again in the server side stub and sent back over the network to the client where it gets um, unmarshaled by means of this infamous return statement, which is implemented in this stuff. This stuff and that stuff is automatically generated. Okay, you don't have to worry about that. Now, if you talk about objects, and this is, this is a surprisingly nasty slide actually, you can have compile time objects, Java, C++, whatnot, Language level objects, um, you take that stuff, notably the interface specifications, and you generate your stubs. Okay? Um, but you can also have runtime objects, and this is where it gets a bit nasty. They can be implemented in any language, but they re require the use of a so called object adapter, and I'm going to try to explain what that is, that makes the implementation appear as an object. And that's, you have to uh, keep this in mind a bit. I'll come back to the uh, runtime objects in just a minute. Then there are other two types of objects, transient and persistent objects. The transient ones, they go away when the server dies, and the persistent ones stay there independent of the lifetime of a server. So typically, these would be database objects, and these would be, well, let's call them compute objects, okay? Um, there is not necessarily a very strong distinction between the two. What you can often do is you can say, I'll have a transient object, and it first reads in some state from a local disk, and tell me, is that a transient object or is it a persistent object? It may have gotten a different object identifier, okay, that makes it transient, but hey, it's working on state that I apparently saved before. And that's kind of the persistence part. Let's take a look at these object servers. And I'm, I, um, so I, just, just to make sure that I have the right reference, how many of you have actually worked with object servers and object stuff on, on these servers? Uh, let me see some hands. RMI, it counts a bit, but RMI, it, it hides a lot of stuff. Uh, how many of you have implemented objects using C? Okay, C++? Okay, and also with remote invocations? A few, okay. Means most of you haven't. Pay attention. So this may sound a bit abstract, but just start thinking in terms of normal programs, okay? Um, I don't think many of you have ever programmed in COBOL. How many of you have programmed in COBOL? Very good. I haven't, by the way, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, it still exists. I think uh, COBOL is probably the most widely used language today. Have you ever thought of that? Do you, know, do you have the statistics on that? Um, they say 80% of the total yeah, 80%. 80 right. Makes you wonder, right? And we're not teaching you COBOL. Hey. It's, 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 it's a huge percentage. COBOL is not dead. I don't care. <laughs> it's even so bad that you don't even want to touch it anymore, okay? But it's there. That's, that's the most important observation. Uh, um, it's actually also interesting because I will, I, will, I will make the following kind of a blunt statement. Who cares about the language? I do this on purpose. Oh, don't worry, we can get a lot kind of holy wars on good languages and bad languages and whatnot. I don't, I don't worry, I can, I can, we can have a decent fight about that. But the end is, who really cares because it's the programs that matter? And of course, for maintainability and programmability, of course, there are very good arguments to have language A over B. Okay? But in the end, as soon as the program is running, who cares? It's a bit of a blunt statement. But that's the reason why there are so many COBOL programs over there because well, actually we do care because we don't want to touch them anymore but they're, they're legacy things and they're, they're doing their job. Yes? No, that's true. It's a, that's a subtle difference. We don't even want to touch them anymore. Oh, you can. 
You can always touch things. You don't don't worry. You you can still you you can touch them. You can you, know, you can. You don't know what the result is, but that's uh, okay. <laughs> okay. Now we're in this this COBOL mode, and we're all we all agree that COBOL has nothing to do with objects, right? Okay. I'm telling you, it has. So what you what I'm trying to make clear is that you can have these functions regardless in which language they're actually implemented that act on structs, records, database tables. That's all fine. Um, the most important thing is they, they, you have implementations working on data, okay? And, and yes, they could also be Java or C++ classes, and now comes the hard part. I want you to not think of a Java object as the, this, as the object necessarily in your distributed system. Your objects can be built out of multiple Java objects or multiple C++ objects or a library of COBOL functions. That's, what I, that's the mode I want you to get into, okay? It's just code that works on data. And my goal of an object server is to make sure that I have this encapsulation of this data with the implementations, the code operating on that data. And then from the outside, hey, it just looks like an object. That's the, what an object server needs to do. So what's the scale? And this is called the servant. N not, not, not my choice, but hey, it's, uh, when you read a book, you read about servants, it's the actual implementation of an object. Then you have the skeleton. They call it a skeleton. And it's the server-side stuff for handling the I.O. So that's where the marshalling and the unmarshalling comes from. The object servers, they have an object adapter. This is, conceptually, I found this an extremely difficult thing to, to grasp. It's the manager of a set of objects, manager, quote, unquote. What it does, it inspects incoming requests and then ensures that what it is requesting for is alive. Call it active, okay? It makes sure that if you want that object, that you want to invoke method X on this object that you have just referenced, to, that that invocation will take place. And that can mean that, for example, uh, the library that is implementing the functions that are operating on the database needs to be dynamically loaded into main memory. That's what an object server will, uh, will establish by means of its object adapter. So it ensures that the reference object is activated, whatever that may mean, okay? Depends on the implementation of your adapter. It passes the request to the appropriate skeleton, following a specific activation policy. An activation policy has everything to do with threads. Will you have a single thread that will run through this object, call the functions, and then will operate on the data? Or will you allow multiple threads to operate concurrently on that object? Why? Because, for example, the data of that object has been implemented by means of a database and you already have locking functions on the database, meaning that you already have made, sh that you already ensured by means of the use of the database that concurrent threads on that object will not intervene with each other. Okay? Um, so those were two activation policies. And in the end, this is an interesting one, we'll get to that in just a minute. The, the object adapter is responsible for generating these so-called object references. And an object reference is a bunch of bits, and when you hand this over to your local part of the distributed system, it'll say, hey, I know what to do. Because those bunch of bits contain information, for example, on the IP address of the object server, so the first thing that happens, hey, let's just move this over to the object server. And let's assume it's using a standard port, and you hand it off through a TCP connection to a standard port of the object server, and it says, hi, those are my bits. Let me take a look at the second part of those bunch of bits. Yes, I have that object. You get the picture, right? Okay, watch this. So here's a picture. Yes. Yes. Prepare the object on the server and everything, and then it passes back an object reference. 
No, 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 no. What you do with an object reference is you say, I want to do this with the object. And then you're, you're, you're referring to two things. What is this? It's a method call. And on the object is your reference. So you pass a request to invoke a method on an object. That's interesting. Oh, that's a very interesting question. To whom? That's a good question. So I'm saying I want I to call A on object X. That's what you do, right? right? And you're asking me, so whom? To whom are you doing what? Who has the answer to this question? <coughs> the owner of X. Tell me more. Did I talk about ownership? Who's the owner of X? Where it's running. Is it running somewhere? On the object server. Well, that doesn't answer your question. You're getting very close, by the way. Oh, X is running at the object server. Now, you, this is an extremely nasty question. You should be able to answer it. To whom? If I give you the answer, you'll say, oh, yes, of course. So standard port. No, 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 no. What? Woo! Thank you. Now we're there. Basically, you know who whom is? It's the distributed system. I have an interface to the distributed system, right? I'm running an application on top of that distributed system. You know who whom is? It's the distributed system. And what I pass to the distributed system is, hey, I want to invoke method A on object X. So I prov provide it with A and X. And then the distributed system says, I know what to do with that. Because then I analyze X. X is your reference. It has everything to do with your name resolution. It will resolve this name. It's a bunch of bits. And what could happen is that this bunch of bits is structured like this. The first part refers to an IP address that holds the object server that is responsible for, for this object X. Okay? Watch out, I'm mixing two things. X as a name, as a reference, and the abstract notion of the object that, that has this reference. I'm not distinguishing the two. So your distributed system then takes this thing and says, here, object server, moves over to this part with this IP address, and let's just for simplicity assume it was a standard port, it says, it's about this object. You generated this reference, so you should know more about it. And then what the object server does, it, re it reads the second part of X and says, yes, I know what it is, and I'll get to that in just a minute. And then it moves this whole request for A up to the right point where indeed a function will be called, operates on data, and the result is sent back to the client. So the, the object manager can be totally separate from the object server? Oh, absolutely, it is. But the, your whom is the distributed system. And that's called access transparency. Got it? Yeah, it's, it's a, a nasty question. Yes. Ah, another good question. Did I, didn't I just violate the rule of not interpreting the bits in a name? Yes, I did. Oh? When would I be violating that rule? Yes. When I say this is an IP address and I send it to that IP address, but not if I see an IP address and, well, interpret it as a string of bits which has an identifier for a server which may not necessarily have to have the same IP address. Uh, so, no, no, it's not, it's, it's not about the IP address. The, the, I like your question. Um, for reasons I want to explain in a few steps. And uh, the steps are by means of questions. When would I really be violating 
the rule that I am interpreting the bits of a reference. Let's start with I. Who is I? It's not me as a person, of course. Hmm? Middleware. Is the middleware violating its own rules? No, it's not. If the application would do this, would the application be violating the rules? Yes. So to the application, it's a pure identifier. And what you're now hearing me say is that to the middleware, it's not a pure identifier. In fact, it's a structured name. That's the reason why I liked your question. So apparently, this has to do with a level at which you're using names. And I would say, no, as middleware, as the generator of this reference, I'm not violating my own rules. This is how I constitute it. If an application would start using it, then that application would be violating rules because that reference is mine and for you as application to use as a pure identifier. So the applications can only use it for comparison, but I'm allowed to use it for interpretation. Good question. It's, 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 uh, it's tricky, very, very tricky. Does everybody understand my reasoning? Okay. Now, how does this reference start? Well, here you see uh, an object server with three objects, okay? I'll, I'll deliberately call this a request demultiplexer. In practice, it's also implemented by means of an object adapter, but we'll skip over that detail. Watch this. I have a number of decision points. This is one. This is what I call the IP address. Now, it gets over here to a request multiplexer, and by that I mean, hey, this guy is serving a bunch of objects, and I'm distinguishing it between different object adapters. For example, I'll, I'll, th because an object adapter may be using different activation policies, and by that I mean how many threads are you willing to let concurrently operate on an object. And maybe this is an object adapter that says, uh-uh, one thread at a time. And this may be an object adapter with a policy, I can handle multiple, ob uh, multiple threads at the same time. So I installed two different object adapters. That means that I will have to provide information on should this request go to the left or should this request be go to the right. I put that information in my reference. And that means that this request demultiplexer will do a table lookup to see to which adapter it's actually referring to, okay? Now let's take this guy over here. It says, oh, wait a minute. I'm an object adapter, and I'm having multiple objects under my hood. So there will be another dereferencing and another table lookup to see to which object you're really referring to. And this is how you get your object references. As an example, they can consist of an IP address. They can even have an additional port number if that's, re is that, if that's relevant, then local and generated by the object manager, you could say, no, go to the left or to the right when it comes to object adapters. And you, let's say you can, you can sustain up to 256 object adapters, or maybe 255, I should say. And then within the object adapters, you have another lookup to actually demultiplex it to the right object. So you see that you suddenly have a very structured name that to the application appears as a pure identifier. And it should because the last part doesn't make any sense, you know. The IP address is something, hey, I, I think I, that thing is over there. But the other part is so specific to the object server, it's the only one who can actually interpret all these messages, these references. Okay. So the object servers determine how their objects are constructed and how they are referenced. Okay. Now, um, let's take a look at a system called ICE. ICE is uh, uh, it's kind of a wonderful system, actually. Um, I dug it up years ago. It's been written by uh, Michi Henning, who is a, uh, I think I mentioned this uh, during one of the, the first classes. Um, he's, a, he's a CORBA expert. Uh, together with uh, Steve Finoski, they wrote a really good book on, uh, uh, it's called uh, uh, C CORBA programming in C++, or maybe it's C++ for CORBA, I don't know, something like that. 
And uh, you have to understand that Steve Vinosky and Misha Henning, they are, they are die-hard systems programmers. So these guys really know what they talk about. Well, Misha Henning got fed up with CORBA because CORBA is all about standardization and committees and whatnot. And he got concerned about uh, losing simplicity. And what he did is he built from scratch a complete new uh, distributed system, object-based distributed system, it's called ICE. And it has a documentation of over 1,250 pages. I think by now it's even more with all kinds of language bindings. But the nice thing about this system, it's, it's in, the, uh, in, uh, in the public, you can read the code. And uh, this is really a, a big array to Misha Henning and his crew. You can read the code and understand what's going on. And I'm talking about the implementation of the system, okay? So if, if you ever uh, want to see how a real system could work, dive into ICE. Uh, my plan is to actually uh, put more of this kind of stuff into the third edition. Um, let me first explain this example. This is, this is probably as simple as an object server can get. Yes, it is a single program. That's the reason why you start with main, okay? And ignore all the, 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 the not appropriate C statements that I'm making. Um, so of course you, you import your ICE library and um, you set up an interface, uh, or actually your runtime system I should say. You're going to have an adapter. Uh, this is of course in C++. You're going to have an adapter, you're going to have an object, and what you do is you start with initializing your local runtime system of your distributed system. Okay, so this is what's now going to be running on the server. And you have a couple of initial initialization arguments and you pass that by. Okay. Now here comes the hard part. You create an adapter. And in this case, you create an object adapter with endpoints. It's really called that way. My adapter, and apparently you're going to accept incoming TCP calls listening to port 10,000. Okay, you do this by hand. You create a new object, and now you see that this is completely consistent with uh, what I just discussed. You add that object to the adapter, and you get something back like an object ID. I think this is a return value. Uh, but now what you've done, if you've placed a newly created object, and I'm assuming that it was created over there, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on. You actually had new with all kinds of whatnot, that really doesn't matter. Um, uh, but you add it to the adapter, and now you activate the adapter. For example, with a policy saying, hey, uh, a single thread. And now you just wait for your shutdown. And that's it. You just have your object server up and running. This is as simple as it can get. Actually, I tested this code, it works. I, wouldn't, I moved, removed a couple of things, but this is as simple as it can get. And now you understand that there's a lot of stuff going on under the hood, and it's all the stuff I just explained. So this object ID is now something that you can pass on, and will have all the relevant information, and once you pass that on to the I system, your request for evoking a method at that object will be passed to exactly this object server and it will know exactly what to do. It will namely invoke this object over here. Now, the reason why I mentioned ICE before is because of um, this statement. Um, notably the, 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 the second one. ICE aims at simplicity and achieves this partially by putting policies into the middleware. So if you look into the ICE code, the reason why you can read it is because it has decided to do so many things for you. There are lots of mechanisms, but hey, they are used in one specific way. That's called a policy. So ICE has made some sensible policy decisions for you, and they are hard-coded into the system. If you don't like them, tough luck for you. But it does make the system extremely simple, and it works. And that may not always be a good reason to adopt a system. Um, no, I will not make a statement about that. Uh, but in this case, it does, has led to simplicity in ICE. Um, activation policies can be changed by modifying the properties attribute of an ad adapter. So if you have this adapter over here, you can change how it's sort of supposed to behave by just changing attributes. Is this uh, example clear to everyone? Most important for me 
is that you see the relationship between object ID, the server, the adapter, and the object. Okay? And this is how you mimic objects. I haven't said a single thing about this thing over here, how that thing is implemented. And you can imagine that there can be a gazillion ways of doing this in a language-independent way because there are very many different language bindings to ICE. Yes? Let me repeat that question. Does the system decide what your object ID will be? Okay? Does anybody have an answer to that question? Yes? Uh, one thing I want to ensure object ID has to be something which will be unique, which is like a GUI of the program. So object ID can be generated by the one who has developed an object or the function that constitutes an object. Like uh, a COM programmer, a COM server decides what the object, uh, what the GUI ID will be. Will be like. Okay. That will be analogous to object ID. Okay. So you're saying uh, you can, out of band, generate an object ID. Yeah. Okay. That's not entirely an answer to your question. Where does that, let, let's make that assumption. How did you get your object ID? Can you just throw in a bunch of bits? It can be generated locally. I'm going to rephrase this question. Should it be allowed? that an application can generate its own, and watch this, system-independent object ID. Because basically that's what you're... Yeah, the object ID will have the form of an ID, a socket, and then something, something. You're making a lot of assumptions here. Yeah. <laughs> so let me rephrase this question. Should an application be allowed to generate a system-independent object identifier. It, would, it really wouldn't know what to do. You could then argue, well, if that's possible, then you should be able to register your, your really nice object identifier. And the registration would mean that you would also have to tell, oh, by the way, I have this really neat pure identifier that I'm not supposed to know what it's all about, and will you please bind it to that object over there? That's not going to happen, okay? So what you will be doing is you will ask the system, even if, you're, if the application does that, will you please generate an object identifier for me? Oh, and by the way, this is where I will want to have the object placed. And what will happen in practice is that the object identifier will come from the server. So you do a create something like that and you get an object identifier back, yes? Let me hold that question. It's a very important one. So, you know, can you have something like local identifiers? Uh, I'll get to that in just a minute. It's a, it's a very important question, actually. Uh, this, note of, this idea of these identifiers has everything to do with naming. I, I really appreciate your question. And it's, uh, it's a nasty one. Let's see why it's nasty. Um, and when am I going to see when it's nasty? In just a minute. Yeah. Okay, so what you do is once you have your object system, uh, take a look at Java, you'll have your remote method invocation. If you go through this slide, it's exactly the same as with a remote procedure call. You have your client invoking a method at a stub, the stub marshals the request and sends it to the server, the server ensures a reference object is active, you know, boop, get it up and running. Request is unmarshaled at the object skeleton, the stub, and then um, if it this is important. If a request contained an object reference, the invocation is applied recursively. Whoa, this is something new. This is something that we didn't have before with a remote procedure call. So if your object is referring to other objects, good. I'm assuming here, just have the object reference and you know how to invoke this other object. And in fact, you do. Because the object reference tells you where to go to. And then you just provide, hey, call add and it will call that. It will be now the object server. Result is marshaled, passed back to the client, and, and on marshals, and re result is returned to the application. Just 
almost the same as a remote procedure call, except that we now have global references. So it's much easier than the case of a remote procedure call. Well, almost. Server can simply bind to the reference object. It knows where it is. Invoke a method. Unbind when it's no longer needed. Hey, go dump the whole stuff back to, to the disk. OK. A client may, in the case of object by value, people have been thinking about this. Some of them thought a bit too hard. You can also have object by value. Because if you can pass references to a method, you know, well, you know, we can also pass an object by value, right? Well, watch this. So in a, a client may also pass a complete object as a parameter value. And you can instantly suspect what will happen. The object has to be marshaled. Well, OK, you know, it's a bunch of bits, so we can perform bits into bytes, and we can bytes into messages, and hey, I have my complete object. And if I do the reverse thing, I will have my object back. And if I have something like a Java system, uh, I am now independent of, of platforms, and it can be interpreted by the virtual machine that we call the run Java runtime system. No sweat, OK? So that should be possible. So you marshal its states, you marshal its methods. Let's just go for the whole thing. I mean, these are just bytes again. You know, They can be interpreted by the other object server, because we're all running the Java virtual machine. Server unmarshals the objects. We created a copy of this thing. I hope that's now clear to everyone. So passing the object by value means put it into a bunch of bytes that you can put into a method. The complete thing, okay, just a naive implementation, you ship it to the server, it's unmarshaled, you create the object, watch out with the object, you create a copy of the object, and hey, the object server starts executing this thing. So object by value passing tends to introduce nasty problems. Okay, watch this. Here you have a machine, another machine, and another machine. And I'm making a distinction. I have some local objects over here, O1 and O2. I have a local reference to this object, and I'm going to make a big assumption. I cannot see the difference between a local I, from the application perspective. I cannot see the difference between a local reference and a global reference. Hey, I'm just referring to objects, OK? This is the ultimate access transparency. You all agree with me? And it, yes, it introduces nasty problems. Because if you have this client code over here, an application, that's referring to this local object and referring to a remote object and cannot see the difference, then when it actually calls something else over here and passes this reference to that call, to that invocation, this whole object may actually get marshaled, placed over here, and now I have a copy of this thing. Whereas this reference will still refer to the same object over there. Unfortunately, I can't see the difference. So here you have the ultimate access transparency, and as a side effect of a method invocation, where you pass two references, but you cannot distinguish those two references from one being local and one being remote, you have suddenly, as a side effect, created a copy of one object but not a copy of the others. And you just don't know. That turns out to be a bit nasty. A bit nasty. And I think it was kind of an unwanted side effect. People hadn't realized what this could do. But now you have your ultimate distributed object-based program and you just don't know when you're copying things or when you're not. So it's really completely transparent. And this is a very good point where you, you should ask yourself, is this really what I wanted? And the answer is obviously no. The answer should be, I love transparency, but not when it's really getting in my way. Sometimes I really do want to know when there's a difference between local and global. Um, so if you take a look at this, I always ask every year this question, and half of the years I get an answer. If you see this whole scheme, what's now an alternative implementation for a remote object reference? Just think in terms of Java. And if you know how Java does it, then you know the answer to this question. Copy a remote object to the, to the local machine 
Okay, so, so I, I, I got to provide a bit more information. What I just suggested is that if you take a look at object servers, you take as your object reference a bunch of bits, which is now basically to the middleware a structured name. You know, with an IP address, port number, object adapter, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. And what I'm now saying is that, hey, maybe we shouldn't have a bunch of bits like that, but maybe I just provided you a hint on how you can have an alternative implementation of this. It's being very silent here. That was a recording on. Yes. Can't you make the local, no, 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 I don't want to do that. Can you make the local re reference remote as well? In general, I would argue you want to make every reference a remote one in an object-based system, except for one exception. By definition, except is an exception, except for one case. Self, almost. You're getting close. Self. Self could be. No, no, no. Not a database object. Like this question. The answer is on this slide. Yes, the object doing the proxy stuff. It's called a stub. So what you do is a stub is just a piece of code, right? It has all the information to do the remote invocation, right? It offers an interface and uh, it knows where the object is because it has an IP address. Actually, it has this structured name in encoded inside. And it's a Java thing that I can just marshal and move around a bit. And that's actually an excellent object to pass by value and to use the entire stub, certainly in Java, as your object reference. I just, you know, I hand you out a stub. And the only thing you, you unmarshal it, you have your object. Well, what do you really have is a stub that you can, you know, you have this in interface. Java knows what to do with it. And you call the interface. And what you do is with every function you call in the interface, it goes to that server over there. So let's take the entire proxy, indeed, as our object reference. Works like a charm. Okay, and, that's the, and actually that's the way how they do this in Java. Module all kinds of optimizations. And I don't know exactly what the status is right now, but if you take a look at the uh, size of uh, Java stubs, I think it's in the order of a couple of hundred bytes. Okay? No, that's excellent. Hey, a couple of hundred bytes for an object reference. I think that's cheap. You could argue that's not cheap, but anyway. Uh, let me see where we are. Um, okay, I'll just talk about this slide, uh, and then uh, we'll call it a day. Um, I, I, I put in this slide to make clear that if you have a completely object-based system, you can also do, um, no, whoops, one step back. I argued that if you have a fully object-based system, you will be calling objects, which is basically a remote procedure call, and I argued at a certain point that, hey, that may not be necessarily the model that you want. That's when I introduced message-oriented middleware, and I start babbling about, hey, sending messages back and forth and whatnot, because that's often what you uh, take as, a, as an interface. Well, in the case of object-based systems, you just encapsulate the message passing, again, by means of calls, but now they're only local. And then you can have this scheme, you have request responses to a server sent as messages, and you can decide that you have your application over here that calls something, but basically it's an asynchronous call. And then you can have a callback interface and you provide that interface to your runtime system, to your distributed system saying, you know, whenever I get a response back from the server, just call this interface and then I'll be hooked up to that interface. And the other one is this. 
you have the client application here. It does a call over here. This is an asynchronous call, okay, which is essentially the same as sending a message. You send the message. If you get a response back, well, let's see. But you can call that to see if something's going on. And this is basically how you implement messaging using an object-based approach. Simple as that. Okay? Um, I'll continue tomorrow by wrapping up um, the object-based stuff. I'll be talking about the object references again, and then you'll gradually see why it's important. And coming back to your question, the answer to that will be in hooking up different distributed systems where they can have internal representations of their references, but not across them. And then uh, I'll be talking a bit about some web-based stuff and uh, a bit about file-based stuff. Okay? And I'll definitely finish on time tomorrow.